Admiral Foxlear sucked in a deep breath as a red sack was yanked off his head, leaving him standing alone in the circle of purple light. He looked up instinctively, talons curling in fear. The Game Masters were an unexpected sight, floating above him in three groups of nine. Their saucers were somehow bowl-shaped, tilted back to prevent the occupants from falling out even by accident. There could be no risk of besmirching a Game Master's honour, especially not here in the Hall of Rulings. Pieces such as Vixlir had nightmares of standing in the exact spot he now found himself in, to be tried for some sin committed against the players and the rules. It was known that a piece could never find mercy in the hall. His eyes slid from saucer to saucer, each marked with the black triangle of guilt. So, they've judged me already. For some reason, that thought made him stand a bit straighter, and the tension in his tail relaxed, the tip sweeping back and forth across the polished floor. Peace, Vixlair. You stand before the judgment of the Game Masters for the benefit of the game and players. According to the records, you are recruited by player Asalam, directly from the training schools. As player Asalam was promoted in rank, so were you promoted until you had reached the rank of Admiral. Our records indicate that as of the last points tally, player Asalam had reached the rank of 10th Green, granting him control of a fleet of 50 ships, a fleet you were supposed to command. The records also show that on the 13th round of the 984th season, you returned to the neutral grounds with a mere three ships and your player reported lost, killed outside the boundaries of the game. For this, you have been convicted of treason against your player, cowardice within the face of the enemy, loss of important game resources, and dereliction of duty. As of this conviction, your titles and privileges have been revoked, your lands are forfeit, and your family will be reassigned to a more deserving peace. These are the minimum punishments upon which we shall insist. To consider whether or not you are eligible for further punishment, we will now grant you the opportunity to testify on your behalf. Is that understood? Yes, Game Master. Vixlir took a deep breath to steady himself, and closed his eyes as he remembered the day which decided his fate. It all started when we found the humans. Emerald Vixlir couldn't explain why the downy feathers at the base of his neck were insisting on standing on edge. He had, of course, warned player Azalam about venturing this far from the boundaries of game space, as there were reports that another player had disappeared in the same region not two seasons past. But Azalam had insisted. We must continue to press further outwards, the player had explained, in counter to his admiral's misgivings. If we wish to continue improving our rank, then we need to acquire new talents and skills. Don't misunderstand me, Vixlair. You and your people have served the game well since we made you our pieces, but that's not enough. We need something unpredictable. Something new. That something had been found in what appeared to be a colony of a new race. At first, Vixlair had been willing to disregard the findings of the scouts when they presented their discovery. But Azalam had been unable to hide his delight. Almost as if he knew something that Vixlair didn't. Which wasn't all that surprising, really. The players often had access to information that they didn't share with their pieces. More than one round had been lost because of that. Something both Aslam and Vixlir knew well. So if it was something Aslam hadn't mentioned before, it was something Vixlir wasn't inclined to disregard. But orders were orders. They made their way to the planet in question, and announced their presence by blasting the three grounded ships the humans had been using as the foundation of their nascent colony into so much scrap metal. Shortly thereafter, they landed, ready to accept the human surrender. The first thing that Fixlay noticed was just how unimpressive the humans seemed. They lacked the horns of the Fertilioni. They had no natural armour akin to the Benemi. Nor did they have any telepathic abilities like the Glimmerane. The only thing they seemed to have going for them at all was a dizzying array of skin and hair colours. Their leader was a male, who stood at just shy of three lengths, not counting the additional half length of bright blue hair fashioned into crew's sail running from the top of his face to the nape of his neck. Standing next to him was a woman, the tips of her hair frosted a bright pink. Sitting between them was a strange four-footed beast with grey fur and a long pointed muzzle. It growled as Vixlir and Aslam approached, raising its fur in a way which Vixlir's ancient ancestors would have recognised as a subtle way of saying, I'm going to rip out your throat with my teeth. That instinct prompted the animal to pause, resting a hand on Azalam's shoulder, indicating the player should hold back. Azalam pulled away with a snarl and harsh look for his admiral, holding the glare until Vixlir dipped his head in submission. Then he stepped up to the man with the blue hair, 
and demanded with a slap of his foot against the ground. What is that animal? His name is Admiral Woofington, the man answered, as he rested his hand on the dog's head. The dog stilled, but those hungry golden eyes continued to stare at Azalam. We don't want no trouble, so just tell us what you want and we'll see what we can do about getting it for you so you can be on your way. Aslam's scales hummed in mocking laughter. I'm glad you are so cooperative, but just to make sure there is no misunderstanding, what I am here for is all of you. This is your choice. Serve me or die. The man sucked in a deep breath, then glanced around to his fellow colonists. There was some muttering, but eventually they all nodded in return. He turned back to Aslam and nodded. All right, I guess we'll go with you. Then here's your first task, Aslam replied. Kill the beast. What? There was a general outburst from the gathered humans, but the man with the blue hair simply held up his arm at a 90 degree angle, ending in a bull fist. And that silent command was enough to get the crowd to go silent and still. Just to be clear, sir, you want me to kill my dog? Exactly, Aslam sneered. The man sucked in another steadying breath, then shook his head. His grip tightened on the dog's fur, as he turned back to the rest of the colonists. All right, you hear the new boss. I don't know what space is going to be like, so don't take more than you can carry. I'll... His voice broke as his eyes closed. I'll go take care of the Admiral here. Come on, boy. Admiral Fix Lear couldn't help but keep his focus on the man with blue hair, as the crowd began to slowly disperse. He watched as the man and dog disappeared into one of the low-slung huts the humans had been using as shelters, saw the flash of lightning, heard the sound of thunder, and one last yelp of anguished betrayal. Vixir's tail twitched with the power of the memory. For a moment he forgot all about his interrogators and the fate that awaited him. All he could see was the hatred in the man's eyes as he stepped back outside, carrying a black canvas bag that matched the others being carried by the rest of the colonists. The human surrendered that easily? One of the Game Masters asked. The question snapped Fix Lear back to reality. Yes, Game Master. In hindsight, we should have been suspicious by how easily they were cowed. But Player Azalev's decision to destroy their ships as a method of intimidation meant we were unable to seize anything outside of their personal infotainment systems. From those, we determined that they were from a set of religious pacifists, which we assumed explained the lack of resistance. Still... There were other signs which should have told us we were being deceived. For example, each had a tattoo somewhere on their body, depicting a bird with wings spread over a gas giant under a crossed anchor and spear. Second, they were all physically fit, above the average depicted by their infotainment systems. Third, they all seemed to fall within the same general age range as determined by our medical systems. But most importantly, they had no children. Why would that be important? Because they hesitated a moment. Colonies are typically deployed to either secure resources, allow for expanded population growth, or to dispose of those who do not wish to adhere to expected social customs. In almost all of those situations, it is assumed that there will be children present with their families. The only such time you see a colony established without children is when it is not a colony, but a military outpost or a prison. A prison would have required guards and more security. The Game Masters whispered between themselves for several moments before the primary Game Master hovered a bit closer. You seem to imply this group of humans belong to their military. Then why was there no attempt to resist when player Azalam recruited them? Fixlear's tail thumped against the floor. And that is the primary reason that we discounted the idea of them belonging to a military force. While they were quick to obey, they presented no force in reply, and their only arms were crude chemical weapons suited to dealing with wild animals. The defense of the colony consisted solely of electrical fences and sirens intended to ward off local predators. Furthermore, their individual styles of dress and hygiene made it unlikely they were answering to a higher authority. And there were additional warning signs. Yes, Game Master. If you observe in the records, player Azalam advanced quickly through the ranks over the last three seasons. This was almost entirely due to the humans. It did not matter what sort of competition we placed them in, they had someone or a team ready and willing to go. When confronted with physical tasks, they had everything from gymnasts to grad ball teams. When confronted with table games, it was as if they knew the rules before they were even introduced to them. For every game they lost, they won ten more. And even their losses were close things, decided by less than a three of points. They were, in fact, too good for a race just introduced to being pieces. 
But for player Aslam, that was just more indication that he had made the correct decision in capturing them. We didn't have a problem with them until the siege came on Blee. What occurred during the game? For the first time in a game, humans died. Are you sure you and your men are ready, Sherman? Admiral Vizlera asked, as he studied the map of the battlefield. He looked at the forces arranged against the humans and felt more than a small amount of doubt. The other three battle groups consisted of Dormanaz, considered to be the finest warriors out of all the peace races. Individually, the Dormanaz were eight feet tall, four armed creatures which favoured taking a hatchet in each hand whenever they went into combat. As the rules for the game had been set at primitive levels, that was sure to give them an advantage against the much smaller humans. All the pieces were allowed to take weapons and shields, not even armour. The only advantage that Fixlayer could see for Sherman and his followers was that they had been given the option to select their home territory first. Don't worry, Admiral, we got this, Sherman grinned as he asked the question. It had become their little ritual before each game. Fixlayer would question whether the humans knew what they were doing, and every time Sherman gave him the exact same response. Whether it was a musical performance, or a board game, or a science challenge, always the same. Don't worry, Admiral. We got this. But if the words never changed, the humans had. Sherman's odd haircut, Fixlayer had learned it was called a mohawk, was gone, in favour of being cut down to short stubble. Almost all the rest followed suit. The same fate had befallen their beards and colourful outfits. Now they dressed in nearly identical black jumpsuits, leaving only the odd shape of their women, and the various skin tones as the last way to tell them apart. They still laughed and talked and joked amongst themselves, but that sense of individuality, which had marred them on their long-lost colony, had vanished into a shield of conformity. Still, the humans were becoming popular with the rest of Asalam's pieces. They almost never spoke of where they came from, each claiming to be from a different planet or space station. Vigslair assumed those were just stories. If the humans hailed from as many planets and space stations as they claimed, that would have put their fledgling race on par with some of the more powerful Corwell species, there was no way they would have had enough time to evolve, develop, and expand so quickly, this far out on a galactic arm. Despite their intent on hiding their origins, a wise decision lets Aslam go looking for more of them. They love to share their myths and legends, swapping them for the history of the other races they now live side by side with. Sherman himself had spent more than a dozen nights in Vixler's cabin, learning all he could about the Hamanlin and how they came to be subjugated by the players. And all how the other pieces loved them for it, not only did it forge new bonds with the rest of the crew, but the humans were just as quick to volunteer to help around the ships as they were to volunteer to play the games. It was as if they had decided they were going to be the shield for the rest of Aslam's pawns, sparing the rest of the fleet from the possible consequences of defeat. There had been some trouble at first with the Rashlam, who thought the humans were trying to claim all the rewards for themselves, but after a few mess hall brawls, the humans simply adopted the Rashlam into their ranks as equals. So it was with the worry of a friend more than the worry of a professional that Vixlayer watched through the observation drones as the shuttles dropped the humans off at their designated territory. Watched as they unloaded the long stays with wicked metal heads which they had requested, great weapons known as pikes next to the shields that were almost as tall as the humans who carried them. The humans marched down to the narrow gap that led up to their stronghold and waited, setting up their camp with relaxed ease. The Dormanaz reacted as expected, in theory, each of the three battle groups all belonged to a different player, and thus should have been at odds with one another, but Aslam had profited from the humans just a bit too much in the last season, and there was nothing in the rules that prevented three players from getting up on the fourth. The Dormanaz marched to the base of the pass as a unified force, and began to assault the human defences. Individually, the Dormanaz were bigger, stronger, faster, more capable warriors. Their ability to fight with all four hands made them devastating to fight one on one, so the humans didn't. Instead, they locked their shields together, braced their pikes, with a shout of, Molan Labe! waited for the storm of alien rage and fury. The Dormanaz expected to break the humans under a wave of berserker might, only to find themselves breaking against a still porcupine. Those who rushed the shield wall found themselves impelled by the pikes, while those who held their infamous hatchets could only snarl as they rebounded harmlessly from the mocking faces which decorated the human shields. Warriors who had never known defeat suddenly found themselves being drowned in darkness as the game's nanites knocked them unconscious, removing them from the combat before their wounds turned truly lethal. By the end of the day, two battle groups had been crushed outright. Their defeated bodies pulled away and thrown to the side by the attackers of the third. But victory was not coming without a price. 
Pike snapped and shattered. Shields dented. Weariness started to take its toll on the defenders, while here and there a lucky shot managed to find a gap in the shield wall. One of the Dorminas managed to make it through on the flank, hatches hacking away at the packs themselves. The warrior had given herself entirely to bloodlust as she managed to make it all the way to the shield wall. Her lower hands yanked the shields apart with a bellow of rage as her upper arms reached into the gap and seized two of the humans by their heads. Veins bulged along her forearms as she squeezed and squeezed until the blood gushed through her fingers. Another pair of pikes buried themselves in her chest and throat, driving her back as her nanites started to render her unconscious. By then it was too late. The damage was done. The nanites carried by each peach could stave off death until proper medical care and regeneration could be arranged, but the complete destruction of the brain was more than they could handle. Emerald Fixlear had watched a thousand games play out. Hundreds of moments where time seemed to stop as the momentum of a game shifted from the clear winners to the obvious losers, upsetting all the calculation and expectations. He felt the same pause begin to take effect, as blood splashed shields crashed to the ground, as the humans watched the bodies fall, as the Dominus roared in triumph, only to be matched by a cry of pure rage from the humans. The gap in the shield wall closed with professional smoothness as the reserve poured into place, but the humans were no longer content to sit on the defensive. The microphones on the observation drones screeched in protest, as 98 voices rose in a single unintelligible battle cry, and surged forward into the oncoming Domidas. Even the wounded, those still capable of standing, followed along in the wake, using short saws and broken pikes to finish off any of the wounded Dominas still moving. It wouldn't be a final death, but enough to make sure that each and every one of the four-armed aliens would know what it felt like to have the shadow of oblivion fall over them. Magnificent, aren't they? Azalam mused as he swirled his drink around in a fine stem glass. Imagine what we could do with an entire world of them. Fezalam, you fool. Player? Fixlear's nails clicked against the deck in confusion. He thought he knew all of Azalam's key rivals, but the name Fezalam had never come up before. Forget it, Admiral, Azalam ordered with a bob of his head. By now is ancient history. Shall we go down and celebrate my victory? It took four of the ship's segments to run a shuttle and make it to the planet's surface. By then the humans had already begun to pack up their supplies. Shields were nearly stacked to one side, pikes the other with several bags of trash outlined by stone rings to act as targeting beacons for the orbital weapons. But there, in a place of honour at the centre of the weapons, were two headless bodies, wrapped in cloaks, scavenged from fallen dominas. What is that odour? Aslan swore as he approached the camp. Normally, Sherman and his command staff would have gone out to meet their player, but the exhaustion of the day had won out. Instead, they were seated near the two bodies, taking turns speaking before raising their cups for a drink. Fixlea could feel the loathing carried in their stares at Aslam's question. You think you can play at war and not deal with the consequences? Sherman asked tiredly. He motioned to the two bodies. Henry. Amanda. They had names. They had friends. They had family. Henry we sing on his way to Valhalla. Amanda's story we tell as she returns her way to the wheel. Their courage and sacrifice will be remembered. Their honour and glory spread to inspire others. Throw them in the trash and be done with your silly superstitions, Azan demanded angrily. We will return to the ship at once. Hey, fuck you! One of Sherman's followers, a woman judging from the wraps around the chest, started to reach for one of the nearby pikes, only to slam into Sherman's outstretched arms. Stand down, Wilder. He held his gaze on Azalam, who involuntarily shuffled backwards. We don't leave anyone behind, for any reason. The Amber will take care of things. I will. Fixlear blurted out the words, before he even realised he was about to speak. Being thrown into the middle of the tension would have been the last thing he wanted, but instinct kicked in, as he worked to ease everyone back to calmness. After seeing what one of the pikes had done to the Dominas, Azalan might as well have been a child facing down a stampede of gnarlhorns. I mean, of course I will. I will make sure they are brought up with a recovery. We can hold a small ceremony for them as we pass by the star? Uh, sure. It was one of the few times Fixlear had ever seen Sherman surprised about something. The human stared at him for a moment, then with a slight shake of his head, motioned for the rest of the survivors to follow him back to the shuttles. We did hold a small ceremony on our way out of the system, as I promised, Fixlear testified. The humans all came out for it, even the ones who had not been in the game. More surprisingly, a number of other pieces attended, in order to pay their own respects as well. Player Aslan was noticeably absent, which did not help with the general unrest. By that point, the humans were overwhelmingly popular with the lower pieces, and even some of the mid and upper pieces were beginning to fall into their orbit. 
If I had been more suspicious, I might have been inclined to believe they were preparing to stage a mutiny. As it was, their strict obedience and adherence to policy had put me at ease. They were, if anything, the very model of how a peace was expected to behave. Unfortunately, they were planning something far worse. The Game Master's chair hovered a little bit higher, as somewhere off in the distance an alarm began to sound. He briefly glanced at his control panel before silencing the noise. Explain. What I didn't know at the time was that player Azalam had known about the humans long before we captured them. Do your records show his connection to player Fezalam? Investigating. One of the other Game Masters dropped lower to match the height of the primary interrogator. Player Fezalam is the fifth generational paternal to player Azalam. It appears he also had a meteoric rise through the ranks, 410 seasons past, due to the presence of humans among his pieces. The first and only other player to use them. The Game Master's brow furrowed as she continued to read. It seems that the humans were released from his board. That is unusual. Vixleer's tail thumped against the floor. Exactly. In the course of my studies, there is no other example of an entire race being released from the boards. Individuals, yes, but not entire races. Once the race is taken to be used as pieces, some are always kept back by the players for trade, breeding, and replacement pieces. We know this. The League Game Master waved away Vixleer's explanation. Explain what this has to do with player Azalan's disappearance. Vixleer took another deep breath. I must admit that some of this is conjecture on my part. I believe that while studying his family, player Azalam learned about how well player Fezalam performed while using humans as his primary pieces. However, as Fezalam had released all of his human pieces to their own planet, one they named Eve, they were no longer eligible to be recruited by a player, only encouraged to volunteer. Fezalam had been crafty when he retired them. Their planet is on a fringe of the far outer edge of Fezalam's board. The entire region is actually marked as a nature preserve and off-limits to other players not of his lineage. The only way around the restrictions would be to replace the leadership of the humans on Eve with the leadership of humans loyal to Azalam, and then have them surrender the planet onto his board. That seems... complicated. The League Game Master began to consult their idea of rules, running it against the scenario fix they had described. After a moment, it let out a half. But this matches the rulings. Something Azalam worked hard to achieve. So he brought our captured humans to the planet Eve, expecting to use them to invade. Fixley's tail stopped moving. Only it turned out that was exactly what the humans had intended, since they were first captured. What's going on? Sherman asked as he stepped onto the bridge. Player Azalam and Admiral Fixley hovered over a holographic representation of the system, while on the main viewing screen, the 50 ships of the player's fleet were steadily advancing on a green and brown marble, accompanied by a trio of moons. Several smaller ships crawled out on impulse tries to meet the invaders. Today, you earn your keep once and for all, Peace Sherman, Aslan declared brightly. And today I will make you a king. A uh, king? Not sure I follow much, Sherman admitted. There a game today that you forgot to tell us about? Not in the sense that you're thinking of. Aslan motioned to the hollow tank. This more technically belongs to the board of one of my oldest relatives. Many of your centuries ago, he recruited several humans, much like I recruited you. But when he grew tired of playing with them, he stranded them on this world. Today we rescue them from their prison and add them to my board, where I shall make you their leader. Are you with me? Sherman's lips twisted to the side as his eyes glinted with delight. A planet full of humans? Missing for several hundred years? I got that right? You do, Aslam answered slowly. Now, are you ready to help me free them? Oh, we're going to free them all right, Sherman suddenly grinned. Just not for you. I'm thinking that we're just going to go ahead and liberate this planet, and then figure out what to do with you after. I don't believe you understand the position you're in, Aslam answered shortly. Your choices are obedience or death. If you do not comply, I'll have you and all of your kind vented into space. Well, a little hard vacuum never hurt anyone too much, Sherman chuckled, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen. What is going to happen is that your ships are all going to stand down and will be blown out of the sky. Isn't that right, Admiral? I am afraid I cannot support this. Admiral Vixir swore as he stepped back. I promise you, player, the fleet stands for you. Sherman went right on chuckling. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean you, Vixir. I meant him. As the and Vixir whirled towards the main view screen, as the space around the advancing fleet began to crack and shatter, 
Blue lightning crackled along sleek, oval hulls, as if the new fleet summoned by Sherman's were smashed its way out of false space and back into reality. The largest vessel of Aslan's fleet was the flagship Outwit. The Outwit was just shy of three kilometers in length, with 30 cannons mounted along her spine and belly in 10 banks of three each. An additional eight broadside tubes ran along her port and starboard flanks, allowing her to engage at all angles and ranges. The smallest ship amongst the newcomers was the Guard Dog, five kilometers long and mounting armor dense enough that the gravity sensors on the Outwit classified it as a small planetoid instead of another ship. The Guard Dog didn't mount any external cannons. Instead, emerald beams lanced out from her sides, slicing away guns and swatting down missiles from the ships closest to the planet's defenders. And there were 146 more ships accompanying her. The largest appeared just off the Outwit's bow, filling the screen with a single, nearly unblemished wall of silver. The only marks were the obvious firing ports, harbouring faintly glowing swirls of energy. Sensors, engineering, and comm warning all began to scream as they registered imminent impact with a moon, which hadn't been there seconds ago. Emerald Vic's Lear stared in horror. There was no way to avoid a collision, not with their current acceleration. Just as he was about to order the ship abandoned, the Alwitz shuddered to a halt, her outer bow plates crumpling as she was wrapped up in a wave of gravitic energy. We're being hailed, the communications officer squealed. Un on screen, Vixlear desperately ordered. The silver wall vanished, replaced with a large grey dog with a pointed muzzle. It took Vixlear a moment to recognise the creature from three years ago, as now it wore a white cap and a tailored black coat, the collar decorated by four golden planets. I am Admiral Ernest V. Woofington, of the United Confederation of Species, the dog woofed. The bark was heard through the speakers, but the words seemed to be carried directly into Vixlear's brain. I order you to stand down your weapons, surrender your ships, and prepare to be boarded by my prize crews. Any resistance will be met with lethal force. Any attempt to purge your computers will be considered an attempt at resistance. Any attempt to harbor human, Dominaz, Gritlip, Schwawili, Afinor, Kanzi, or other race designated as a peace will be considered an attempt at resistance. Again, I order you to stand down your weapons, surrender your ships, and prepare to be boarded. I suppose I should explain. Sherman answered, as more humans, armed humans, began to enter the bridge. We actually captured one of your ships about five years ago. They managed to purge most of their databases, but there was enough recovered from the unsecured game records that we could get a feel for where your territory was. Also, that you'd captured a few humans some time ago. Only made sense for us to set a trap, figure out where they were, and come get them. He tapped the corner of his jaw. Quantum entanglement device located in my teeth. Only good for one listening station, but there's no range limit. They've been listening to everything since you picked us up. Nice little homing beacon, too. All they needed to know was where and when to send the cavalry. Now, let's be good little boys, and do what the Admiral says. Player Azalam took one look at the screen, one look at Sherman, and lunged to the fire control panel. Let the record show that Peace Vig's Lear was present for a battle between an unknown hostile alien force, during which point he escaped in the fighting and fled with his surviving ships. During this fight, the player Aslan was lost, believed dead. The Game Master paused as an alarm began to sound again. He scowled and silenced it before turning back to Vic's Lear. Peace Vic's Lear, the only thing I do not understand is how you escaped the bridge when the player could not. Well, that's just it. Vic Lear's towel thumped against the floor. I didn't escape. Explain! The humans had access to the player's databases. They knew they would need to gather your leadership in one place to make it possible for an effective decapitation strike. Problem was, they needed someone to volunteer to be bait. Azalan was a stain on this universe, and I'm glad he's dead. My family? They're already well outside your reach. Not that it's going to matter much longer. My lands? Well, we'll see what the future holds. Chris lit at the side of his neck. Quantum entanglement relay. Good for one listening station only, but absolutely fantastic for calling for help. Because there are two more things that you should know about the humans. First, they really like to make a big entrance. The alarm on the Game Master's chair shrieked his loudest cry yet, as the walls of the chamber vaporized, emerald beams punching half a dozen broad holes for the marble, just moments before the same number of powered armored marines plunged through. The air rippled around their armor as it called for the heat of re-entry. The helmet of their leader popped open as Sherman spit his drop gun to the side. And we never leave a man behind. <laughs>